I am Anthony L. Elmore, president and founder of the Proud Black Buddhist World Association. We at the Proud Black Buddhist World Association practice the Buddhist teachings as taught by the 13th century Japanese Buddhist sage, Nichiren Shonen. The word Nichiren means sun lotus and Shonen means priest. Now, it is Black History Month in America and our topic today is Black Buddhist History. Now, it is Nichiren Shonen who teaches us that the highest teachings of the Buddha, Shakyamuni, was that of the Lotus Sutra. Now, the way that we learn the teachings of Nichiren Shonen, we study letters that he wrote. These letters are called the Gosho. Now, in concert with studying Buddhist teachings, it is the Lotus Sutra is the highest of the Buddhist teachings. Now, our lecture for Black History Month is Black Buddhist History. Now, we approach Black Buddhist History from the standpoint of the Lotus Sutra. Now, the essence of the Lotus Sutra is in the title, and the title of the Lotus Sutra is Myo Ho Ren Ge Kyo. Now, it is Nichiren, who we call Bodhisattva Superior Practices, or Bodhisattva Jogyo. Nichiren added the word Namu. Namu means to awaken. So Namu is actually Buddhism because Buddha means enlighten or to awaken. Now, it means to awaken to the Lotus Sutra. Now, the title or the essence of the Lotus Sutra is in the title of the Lotus Sutra. Now, the title of the Lotus Sutra is Myo Ho Rin Ge Kyo. Now, the word Myo means to open. Now, the word Myo also means correct. The word Myo also means wonderful. Now, the word Myo also means the mind or it's spiritual. Now, the word ho, the word ho means um, life. Ho means life or it means it's an insanzen or the way that life manifests itself. That's ho. Now, the word myo means to open. So, to open to life or to awaken to life, that is myo ho. Now, ren means lotus, and gay means basically the effect or cause and effect, and kyo means the teachings of the Buddha, or it also means to dispel delusion. So, when you got namu myoho renge kyo, that means you awaken to the correct life teachings or essence of the universal teachings. Now, again, our lecture today is called Black Buddhist History. Now, what I want you to do, that in order to understand Black Buddhist History, you have to understand the workings of cause and effect, or you have to understand Ho. See, Ho means it's an insanity. That is, it's an expand, sentence explained like this. It's explained in 3,000 worlds in a momentary state of existence is that that is the way all phenomena it's manifests itself. Now, what happened is that in regards to the Buddhist teachings, a phenomena happened in the Buddhist teachings called racism. That is, at the time of the, at the, in the beginning of A.D., it is a time when Buddhism became separated by race, language, and culture. This is the time in Buddhism where the Buddha was changed from black to white. That is the time it was in Buddhism, it was called Mahayana Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism is the time when they changed Buddhism from black to white and they actually changed or rewrote the history of Buddhism. Now, 
This is why we are giving you a black Buddhist history lesson. Now, what is exciting is that now we have the internet, we have uh, higher teachings, we have we got information technology, so we don't have to rely upon others to teach us or to give us misinformation. For example, uh, I want you to see a picture of the last Buddhist priest. His name was Shinji Iwaki. Now, Shinji Iwaki was a Japanese priest, and a lot of people think that because somebody got a robe on or because they're Asian, you think that they maybe have more knowledge of Buddhism than the average person. It's kind of like in the Christian religion, it's kind of like going to a, uh, a preacher or minister and asking him about the origins of life. See, in order to understand the origins of life or understand the history of Buddhism or anything, we approach things from the standpoint of the Lotus Sutra. See, the Lotus Sutra is the essence of universal teachings, which includes all of the sciences. See, if you're going to begin to talk about life in the universe, you just cannot go to a religious guy who's going to look in the Bible, he's going to tell you what this is how it started. That's a religious aspect. That is a subjective view. In order to get a clear-cut view of life in the universe, then we have to look at things from the standpoint of the Lotus Sutra, which is very objective. Now, there are four ways that we want you to look at Buddhism. Now, when you study Buddhism from the standpoint of the average white person or the average Japanese person or Asian person, you can't look at it from the standpoint of the age, the average person, because the average person, they teach it from a prejudice or a myopic viewpoint. They they do it from the standpoint of a racist viewpoint. Now, the Lotus Sutra deals with objectivity because the Lotus Sutra means again, Myo means to open. It means to open the treasure of knowledge. I mean, Kyo means all of the teachings of the Buddha. Now, for example, the teachings of the Buddha are when we study black history, we study black history from the standpoint of Myoho Renge Kyo or Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. That is, we are studying it from the standpoint of the sciences. For example, let's begin to deal with the issue of the Buddha. See, they teach you or many believe that the Buddha was actually a white person, but in order to dispel this misnomer, we can go into the sciences. Now, we have four ways we're going to look at this. Now, the first, and what I want you to do, and what I want you racists to do, or what I want all the people who said the Buddha was white, let's look at the sciences. The first science we're going to look at is a science called archaeology. Now, archaeology is the physical science where we look at artifacts. We look at something that's physical, like uh, bones of people or the art that they made. And we have a thing called carbon dating, and we can look at archaeology and see how people live. Now, in terms of the Buddha, now, we can go back to where he was born in Magadha, and we there are we can look at Magala, we can look at India, and we can look at the area, and we have archaeological evidence. Now the one thing that no white person could bring up who said the Buddha was white, they cannot provide one single iota of archaeological evidence that there were white people in India, in ancient India. See, ancient India. There was a civilization called the Harappans, or it was the Indus Valley Civilization. The Indus Valley Civilization, there is no archaeological, nor is there any anthropological. Now, anthropology is a science that deals with the culture, the history, the language, the social settings of people. Now, there is no our anthropological evidence of any white people ever being in ancient India or in the Indus Valley because we have ruins that we looked up. They they discovered the Harappan civilization, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappan people 
and these people had a language, they had a culture, all of these things we have a history of and we can go back and we can analyze this history. Now, again, so one of the ways we're going to talk about how the black Buddhist history that the Buddha was black, we're going to look, first thing we're going to look at is archaeology. The second thing we're going to look at is anthropology. Now, the third thing we're going to look at is called literary science. Now, the first thing that we want to do to dispel the rumor that the Buddha was white, let's look at literary science. Now, during the time of Homer, and Homer was a Greek writer who wrote the Illyssi and the Odyssey. Now, Homer, during the time of Homer, India was known as Eastern Ethiopia. Now, this is a literary fact. We have this. Now, in terms of history, the father of history, Herodotus, he was a Greek and he was a historian. The father of history, Herodotus, visited India and they asked him about the land of India. And Herodotus wrote that there were two Ethiopians, one east of the Red Sea and one west of the Red Sea. Now, during the time of Homer, India was known as Eastern Ethiopia. It was not known as India, but if you want to get into the word India, the word India means black. Now, so, India means black. You've heard of India Inc. because India means black. India was the land of black people. Now, we've, we've gone from the standpoint of archaeology. We've gone from the standpoint of anthropology. We go on to literary science and that we can quote Homer and we can also quote the father of history Herodotus. So that gives you some, at least some background as to what the people look like. Now, there are written records of the city of Magadha where the Buddha was born. Now, the written record where the Buddha was born, the people or the founder of the empire of Magadha was Si Su Naga. Now, Naga is associated with the snake. And the people who was in India at the time of the Buddha were Naga people. They were called Nagas. Now, the Nagas eventually, uh, they spoke the language of Tamil. Tamil kind of got mixed up and then they began to go from Tamil and they began to call Dravidia and Dravidia got mixed up and they had a language called Dravidians or the people called Dravidians or they were the indigenous people of the land. Now, around the time of the Buddha or before the time of the Buddha, we can go back to literary evidence and talk about Sin Su Naga. The Buddha was a Naga. Now, the Naga is represented by the snake. The Naga is represented by the dragon. So, we have the history, we have the culture, we have things written down that we can go from Sensu Naga, and we can go from Sensu Naga to Bhisvara, who was the Buddha, who was the leader of the Magadha Empire. Now, at this time, there were no white people. The people who was there was called Nagas. So, that is the first thing, that they were, they were not white people. Now, if there were some white people in India at the time of the Buddha, there would be some archaeological, some anthropological, some literary evidence, or you would have the third thing that we can do to test it is that we have what is called genetic science. Now, the genetic science don't tell a lot. You can go, they did a study at the Hubbabong University in India, and they did the most comprehensive study of the people in India, and they found out that what they call the caste system, and that's the time when the whites were on top, and they created the caste system, that the caste system didn't start until about 150 years into the AD. Now the genetic science even proves it. So how much more do you want to deal with that when you talk about the Black Buddha, we got 
archaeological evidence, we got anthropological evidence, we got literary evidence, and we have genetic science to back up that there were no white people in India at the time of the Buddha. We can go and tell you exactly when whites came into ancient India. Let's continue our Buddhist lecture, and this is Black History Month, and it's called Black Buddhist history. Let's take this thing on. Regards to black Buddhist history, we've shown you an archaeology, anthropology, literary science, and genetic science. Now, let's take this history a little further to give you the understanding of black Buddhist history and what happened. Now, during the first century AD, what happened in India? India was conquered. Now, this is historical evidence. India was conquered by a Kushan king by the name of Kanishka. Now, King Kanishka was a white king who came from the area of Afghanistan. Now, he converted to Buddhism because he was introduced to Buddhism by a Brahmin who was, convert, who was converted to Buddhism. And the Brahmin name was Ashvagosha. Ashwagosha convinced King Kanishka to take up the Buddhist religion, and he did. Now, at that time when he took up the Buddhist religion, he was a white king, and of course the people were not happy with the white king. In fact, Nichiren Shonen mentions King Kanishka in the Gosho and explains that the people did not really accept King Kanishka. But what King Kanishka did, King Kanishka was the person who brought in all of the Buddhists and he, he was the guy who actually changed Buddhism. See, the time of King Kanishka in Ashwagosha is the time when Buddhism changed from a black religion to a white religion because it was King Kanishka who changed the Buddha from black to white. I want you to look at images of Gahara. That's the land that he conquered and what he did was he put his mind into the images and he, this is the first time in history where they carved the Buddha to look like Greek images. You see the mother, uh, the Buddha mother where they give the Buddha a bath and you see all these pictures and these are thousands of years ago. See, during the time of Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhism changed uh, or it was done from the standpoint of race. That is, the history, the culture, and the language of Buddhism was changed. See, King Kanishka came up with what is called the Second Fourth Buddhist Council. Now, the Second Fourth Buddhist Council, see, the Fourth Buddhist Council is the time in what is Ceylon or Sri Lanka where they wrote the Buddhist teachings down. Now, when they wrote the Buddhist teachings down, this is in 29 B.C. They wrote the book, everything down. They wrote everything down in the language called Pali. Pali is a combination of the language of people, and the people spoke Pali, or you had different versions of the Pali language, or the language of Magadha. It was Pali. Now, what happened was, a new language or a new artificial language emerged. This language was created by a Brahmin by the name of Pani. Now, Palini was the guy who invented the language of Sanskrit. See, during the time of the Buddha, the language of Sanskrit did not exist. It is British historian Godfrey Higgins who wrote the 1833 book, The Anaclipsis, who teaches us that Sanskrit was an artificial language based upon the Pali language. And they just took it, and Panini took it and just modified the language. But now, during the time of King Kanishka, King Kanishka had his own fourth Buddhist council where Buddhism was separated by race, culture and language. At this fourth, second fourth Buddhist council, they came up with a new way to teach Buddhism. 
and they teach it through the language of Sanskrit. And it was Ashwagosha, who is the father of this new Buddhism that no one had ever heard of. The new Buddhism is called Mahayana Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism is the time when Buddhism was separated by race, culture, and language. Now, it was King Kanishka who sent out missionaries and the Buddhism got to Asia. Now, the Buddhism that really came into Asia was the white Buddhism, but still there were other Buddhist missionaries who had sent Buddhism out into China before the Mahayana Buddhism. So you had two different schools of Buddhism. You had the Theravana, which is the teaching of the elders or the traditional Buddhism, and you had this new Mahayana Buddhism that was competing. So when you deal with the Theravana Buddhists, you will see the images of the Buddha is always that of a black man. Now, one of the things I want you to look at, and we got to look at archaeological evidence of the Buddha. Anytime you see the Buddha, other than the pictures in the Ganhara images, you will see the Buddha as that of a black man. The way that you're going to tell that the Buddha was that of a black man is that all you have to do is look at the hair. All the images of the Buddha, you are going to see the black hair of the Buddha because the Buddha was black, the people of India was black, and there were no white people who came into India until the A.D. at the time of King Kanishka when the Kushans had conquered the Indian people. Now, let's take this thing into a history that you can understand. Now, again, the kingdom of Magadha was started by Sisu Naga. And it went from Sisu Naga to Bispahara and owned. Now, these were black people. Now, let's go into a little historical evidence to tell you more about the black Buddha. See, during the time of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Great had conquered, um, he conquered or he beat the people who we know, we call them Iranians. The word Iranians are actually another word for Aryans, but they were called Iranians. Now, the Iranians were the people who conquered Egypt. They were whites and they conquered Egypt. They were called Iranians or they're better known as the Persians. Now, it was Alexander the Great who conquered the Persians. When Alexander the Great conquered the Persians, he did a, a uh, what is a new strategy called flanking. They would go through these real small paths and only so many people could go and they would knock them off one by one. See, the Greek, uh, Alexander the Great was very small. He was a, a strategist and he picked off the Persians. They were outnumbered five to one. So when he conquered the Persians, the Persians, in turn, uh, were no longer controlling Egypt, so Alexander the Great conquered Egypt as well. Now, Alexander tried to go up to the Hindu Kush and conquer the Indians, and Alexander came up against the Nandas. When he went up against the Nandas, man, these guys had 80,000 elephants. And these, and Alexander only had horses, and Alexander says, hell no, I am not going to go up there and try to conquer these people. But what was interesting about Alexander is that Alexander, too, was a Buddhist because Alexander was trained by a man called Aristotle. Now, Aristotle was taught by a black man by the name of Socrates. See, Socrates taught Aristotle. Aristotle taught Alexander the Great. So when you go into the history of this, when Alexander the Great met a group of Buddhists, now the Buddhists were not called Buddhists, they were called Jimna Sophists. The word Jim means naked and Sophists means philosophers. So what we see is that we see Alexander the Great moving with these these gymnosophists or these Buddhas. 
Alexander the Great actually brought these Buddhas back to Greece and they introduced Greek Buddhism to Greece and a new Buddhism was, was formed. It was called Hellenism. All you got to do is look up the word Hellenism. Hellenism is a, is a syncretic or a blending of Buddhist culture and Greek philosophy. So the Hellenists were actually the Buddhists and the people, when you go into like the Jews, uh, it was Alexander that told the Jews they can go back home. See, the Jews were originally black people. And when they went back to Jerusalem, the Jews or the Hebrews were Buddhist people. Now, we know this because in ancient, in Jerusalem, there was a king by the name of Alexander Janaeus. Alexander Janaeus was a king and he was also the high priest of Jerusalem. Now how do we know he was a Buddhist? Because he left a Buddhist coin. Now he got into a big fight with a group of Brahmins called the Pharisees. You had the Sadducees and you had the Pharisees. The Pharisees won the battle and the Buddhism was then taken over and what they did was they integrated the Buddhist teachings with that of the Brahman teachings and the two got together they came up with what is called today Christianity because the teachings of the Buddha when you look at the teachings of the Buddha the Buddha had 12 disciples uh, Christ had 12 disciples uh, the, the, the first story of the Christ was Sermon on the Mount the first story of the Buddha was Temptation of Mara uh, Buddha's mama was called Maya and, and Christ was called Mary. Now, the word Jesus means one who anointed one. Now, Nazareth means one who has attained in a, a individual level of enlightenment. So the two came together. Actually, the word uh, karma and the word reincarnation actually was a part of the language and it was changed by a guy by the name of... Um, of work. Why is my mind going blank? Paul. Paul was the Paulite who taught, he was a Brahmin. He was a Brahmin who was supported by King uh, Constantine and actually they checked, what they did was they integrated the teachings of the Buddha with the teachings of, of, uh, of, of Christ and they came up with the teachings of Christ. They came with 66 books of the Bible and when they brought all this together, Buddhism emerged to be what is called modern day Christianity which, if you look at the teachings of Christ, the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the Buddha, uh, the multitudes and all of that kind of comes together. But let's get back into this black Buddhist history. Now, what happened? We told you that Alexander the Great went into the Hindu past and he was turned around by a group called the Nandas. Well, what happened was there, was a, there were two competing forces in India. There were the Nandas and there were the Muriams. Now, Gopta Chupta Miriam was the king of the Miriams. The Miriams conquered the Nandas. Now, the Miriams were black people. They had the nappy hair. They were called the Miriam Empire. Now, the, the head of the Miriam, his grandson, actually, he was a tough warrior. He was kidding a lot of people, but he changed his life and he, in turn, converted to Buddhism. And he was the grandson of the Miriam, of Gantapucha Miriam, and his name was King Asoka, who is known in the annals of Buddhist history. Now, King Asoka left writing, and he left writings all throughout India and he wrote letters to what he did with the Greece and people in Africa and he sent missionaries all around. This was King Ahsoka. Now how do we know about King Ahsoka? King Ahsoka sent missionaries to Africa. Now one of the things that we want to bring to your attention, attention we want you to see uh, is called the Apodemic Temple. Now the Apodemic Temple, you got to understand that there were different people in India, in Egypt or in Africa. See, Egypt 
was a part of the Nubian Empire. They were con they were kind of conquer each other. But now a group of people came into India called the Hycos. The Hycos were actually the Jews or they would call them the Shepherd Kings. The Hycos actually conquered India. Now you had two different types of people, which were the two different names with the same people. One was called Naga and another was called Nubian. See, the Naga and the Nubians are one and the same people. See, when the Nubians or the Hycos came into Africa, they came into Africa and they brought the Buddhist teachings with them. They conquered Egypt. Now, the way that you know they were Nagas, because you would see the snake. So when you see the snake, the snake meant wisdom. Now, the Buddhists, the Nagas, and the Nubians were in ancient Egypt and Nubia, and they were also in a place called Abyssinia, because it was the Abyssinians. Now, the oldest documented history of kings and queens, is that of the Ethiopians or the people who call themselves Ethiopians now but in the old days or in the Bible they were called the Abyssinians. Now the Abyssinian, that's the old name for Ethiopia. If you look at the Abyssinian they look just like Indians because they came from India. See people who came from Africa you had different types of people. You had the Gramati man who looked like what you call the Negroid with the wide features and the and the curly hair, and then you had the other black who were the proto astrologs who had straight hair and keen features, but they were one and the same people. They were different people from Africa. Now, let's go into talk about Buddhism. Now, Buddhism, do King Asoka, even before King Asoka had ever made it to Egypt, we have evidence that the Buddhist teachings was in ancient Egypt because the people. Now, there was a group of people who came from India. They were a tribe, they were Jewish or Hebrew, and they were also Buddhists. They were a tribe, and they were the main Jewish tribe, they were the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah were black Buddhists who had came into Africa. So Buddhism was in Africa thousands, at least over thousands thousand of years before Buddhism ever got to Japan. Now, most of us who learn Buddhism, we learn Buddhism from our Japanese brothers and sisters. Now, one of the problems of learning Buddhism from the Japanese brothers and sisters is that when Buddhism got to Japan, most of the Buddhism came in the form, or at least the dominant Buddhism today is that of Mahayana Buddhism. Now, in Mahayana Buddhism, they extricate all the black history, culture, and language. Now, one of the things I want you to look at, I want you to look at the first temple or the first Buddhist platform that took place in Japan. Now it was king, the king, the, the Japanese king or emperor. The Japanese emperor set up this in Shomu. He set up this temple in the ancient capital of Nara. It was called Toda G Temple. Now the Buddha, or at least the messenger of the Buddha, Nitrin Shonen, talks about. Toda G Temple. Toda G Temple is where the great Dingjo in Japan got his teachings. That's what he learned. And when you go to Toda G Temple today, it is a UNESCO or a United Nations World Heritage Site. You can see this Buddhist history in early Japan because they were not influenced at the time by Mahayana Buddhism. They were Theravana Buddhists and they set up the platform and that's where you see the Black Buddha. Look at the Cosmic Buddha. This is Black Buddhist history in Japan. Now, one of the things that you must understand that our teachers, 
of the SGI, Nitrin Shoshu, and Nitrin Shu, they all practice Mahayana Buddhism that extricates all black history, culture, and language from Buddhism. For example, the SGI, that's the Soka Gaka International Leader, is Dasaki Kato. Dasaki Kato writes in the book, it's a fictionalized book about the life of the Buddha called the Living Buddha, and he writes that the Buddha was an Aryan. Now, Akedo was wrong about this. He knew better, but he understood if he told the truth, Buddhism would not be pro projected or promoted because in order to go into certain cultures or even come into America, they would rather tell a lie and tell you that the Buddha was an Aryan or an Indo-Aryan because what they're promoting is a white culture. Now, in the book, The Living Buddha, Dasaki Keita writes that the Buddha was an Aryan. Now, this goes against archaeology, anthropology, it goes against literary science, and it goes against genetic science. But because Dasaki Keita is a religious man, or because people wear a robe and have a bald head, people listen to a priest or religious leader as opposed to looking at the science. Now, those of you who are African American and you want to know your black Buddhist history, you know that Buddhism was in ancient Egypt. It was brought there by the Shepherd Kings. The Shepherd Kings came into Egypt and they went on to establish a land in Africa called Abyssinia. The Abyssinia were the Aksum Empire, and the Aksum Empire controlled India because they were the same people, they were the shepherd kings, they were warriors, and they contained India. How do we know this? Because there's a written documentation called the Kibra Nagas, a Naga. They were Naga people, they spoke the language of Ethiopian Gese. Gese is the same as Sanskrit because Sanskrit came from Gese. Now, what we know about ancient Buddhist history is that the Queen of Sheba went to India and met with King Solomon. Now, she controlled the territory and she met with King Solomon and they had a child who was called Menelik. Menelik became actually the inheritor of the Jewish land because he was the father of Solomon, which comes back down to King David, which comes back down to Jesus. See, all this was interrelated. Now, for example, when you go to ancient Italy, you got to understand that the first Italians were black people called Etruscans. The Etruscans were black people. And so when you go into the history of the Etruscans, they were black people, and they were the people who organized what we call Italy. Now, when you look at the story of the Christians being fed to the line, they were actual peaceful people called the Samaritans, or the Good Samaritans, because they were the Buddhist people, and they were the people who were the peaceful people. I think that we have given you a little black Buddhist history, at least for starters. You know that the Buddha's first person who started Magadha was Sen Su Naga. You know that the Naga and the Nubians were the same people. Now, it was the father of history, Herodotus, who wrote that the ancient capital of Moro was the cradle of the Gymnosophists. We also know that the language of Moro, they spoke Karasi script and the Buddhists brought Karasi into Africa. So when you look at the Nubians, the Ethiopians, and the Abyssinians, and the black people in India, Buddhism was in Africa, at least the Lotus Sutra was in Africa, over 1400 years before it even got to Japan. Now, if you look again at the Aphrodite Temple, you will see the Ahsoka lion head 
coming out of the lotus flower. This is at the temple. Here's your archaeological evidence. There were no white people in any at the time. Now, how this thing got started of the Buddha becoming white because a German came into India and he looked at the caste system and he told the story of the caste system how they had made people who were black at the bottom and people who were white at the top and they, there was a story called the Vedas. The Vedas is a story, you got the Rig Veda, you got different Vedas and in these Vedas they told a story about some super white men coming in and they conquered India and they turn around and sub subjugate the people into the caste system. This was not true at all. There is no archaeological, anthropological, genetic science or any evidence that any Aryans came in and conquered India. This did not happen to the AD and we got archaeological, anthropological, literary science. Now one of the things we want you to do, there was a Greek ambassador called Mothegonese. Now, Mothegonese was the Greek ambassador. He wrote a book called Indica. Now, you can go to look at his writings and you can see that there were no white people at the time. So, we got the literary evidence from the father of history. We can go to the time of Homer. We can break this thing down. Now, that Buddhism was never a white religion. These were Buddhists. These were black people. Now, in conclusion, there are a lot of people that want to say, what difference does it make whether the Buddha was black or white? Well, let me tell you this. It's a big difference because the reason of this is because distorted ideas brings about delusion. Now, the word namu myoho renge kyo, or the word kyo means to dispel delusion. Now, what happened was about 1850 or so, there was a white man who was, a, I think he lived in England, but he was born in Germany, called Max Muller. Max Muller read the Vedas. And he read the Vedas and he told this story about an Aryan invasion and what had happened. And what happened was this misnomer led people to believe that white was superior to black or to the dark skinned people. Now, what happened was a man from Germany, who we all know by the name of Hitler. Hitler did not want to deal with white people per se, or did not want to deal with the Christian, did not want to deal with the Jews. So he wanted to find a way to promote his superiority. So what he did was he adopted the teachings of the Hindu racism. He adopted the swastika. He adopted the Hindu religion, which was the swastika, and he made that the logo of the Germans who were the superior race. He got this because Max Muller did not vet or study or put out any kind of evidence about these Vedas. He just took this information and promoted a lie. He promoted this Sanskrit. Now, what we know about Buddhism in Africa is that in the Fourth Buddhist Council, that happened in Ceylon, or what is the day, Sri Lanka, they talk about the blind Mia of Nubia. So this is documented about the black Buddhists. I think that we have given you a little black Buddhist history. We'll go a little bit further later on. I am Anthony Alf Elmore, president and founder of the Proud Black Buddhist World Association, bringing you a little bit of black Buddhist history. Thank you very much. Tell me what the land I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the land I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the land I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the land I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the land I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the land I see. Disregard what the facts may be. All ancient icons show a simple fact. They all show that the Buddha was black. 
I believe in facts and Akeda was wrong Pluto was no Aryan This song saw the history But those who rewrite history Run that to the death so to understand It was a thousand years as the Buddhist dealt His teacher right in Japan Let me tell you something that makes sense The Buddhist teachings did not start in the Orient Those of you make a religious decision The Buddhist teaches no ancient religion The Buddhist religion has a lot of mystery Ancient took out all the black Buddhist history Let me lay on you the history and the facts Look at the ancient Buddhist statues he's always right Let me lay this on you all the black Buddhist history And take out all the Buddhist mystery the land today they call India In the old days it was called Eastern Ethiopia The first river in the land were called Dravidian The same people that they were called Nubian It is the land where we find the birth of racism It all started in a religion called Brahmanism A Nuism They created the world's first religious racism They created a system called caste That made black people eternally last the Vedic religion was called Brahmanism. It was distorted teachings of ancient Buddhism. Let me let you in on some facts. The icons of the ancient Buddha were all black. Let me break down to you the Buddhist mystery. Shakyamuni Buddha was the first Buddha recorded in history. Let us not get our thoughts mixed. The elder Buddha came from Egypt. He was called Hermes Travagastus. The Buddhist teachings come from other lands. The Buddhists we learn come from Japan. The Buddhism that the Japanese teach comes in mystery. That is because the Japanese extricated the black Buddhist history. Expand your mind and gain power. Let us go to the ancient Japanese capital called Nara. At the ancient Japanese capital in Japan called Nara, there is a temple called Todachi. This temple is where a world heritage site be. We're not to believe when our line eyes see. When it comes to the facts, do not be alarmed. This world largest Indo Buddhist statue is made in bronze. This bronze statue is about 50 feet high. When it comes to the Buddha, the Japanese will not lie. The world's Indo Buddhist statue is made of bronze and gold. We should disregard the facts that the statue is black. Do not be whole. Disregard the facts and believe what you're told. The hell, this Buddhist statue does not make sense. When they made it black and nappy, it was an accident. They called me Sensei Akeda, I'm the SCI president. I'm like a Buddha, I'm never wrong. Disregard the Buddha stature. The Buddha was not black, he was Aryan. In my knowledge to learn about the black Buddha, I did persist. I went to the Japanese priest and asked him to explain a picture like this. The priest says, forget your lying eyes. No black Buddha statue exists. I said the black hair on the old Buddha statues don't make sense. The priest says, don't believe your lying eyes. The black hair is just an accident. In the Buddha world, the black Buddha's mystery. Because the angel removes all the black Buddha's history. Educate yourself regarding the Buddha's history. But learning black tell tell me, a history. What the lying eyes see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the lying eyes see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the lying eyes see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the line I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the line I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the line I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the line I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the line I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the line I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the line I see. Disregard what the facts may be. Tell me what the line I see. Disregard what the facts may be. All ancient icons show a simple fact. They all show that the Buddha was black. I believe in facts and the Kato was wrong. 